if you wanted a fancy car that looked really, really fancy, there was this thing called white wall tires, all right? And basically, tires, rubber black tires, had white stuff on the side, okay? And that, and that was more expensive. Now, to keep the white wall tires clean, they used to stack tires up vertically, but they put paper in between the white walls. Um, and they kept doing this. Now, by the time we got to the 70s and 80s, no one was buying white wall tires anymore. Those just out of style. But they kept building them and stacking them with this paper in between. Um, at some point, now that actually cost a lot of money for some reason. And at some point, some guy came and said, uh, we need to save money. And he just looked at, you know, well, all this money we're spending on the paper in between the white wall tires. And they said, why do, why do we protect the tires? They said, well, you know, because they, no one really knew. No one knew why they, just, they kept doing it. And finally, they found out that, well, it was a carryover from the time when they had white wall tires, but they don't have white wall tires anymore, but they're still spending all this money and time protecting tires that are black as if they were white walls. And so eventually, they just got rid of it, and some guy saved the company a lot of money. Um, that's what I mean by foolish consistency. Sometimes we just do things over and over again just because that's the way we do it. Why do we do it? That's the way we always did it. But why do we do it? I don't know, because that's the way we always do it. Maybe at one point in time in history, it was a smart idea, or it was, might have been a dumb idea, actually, but it's just what they did. And But we keep doing things over and over again, you know, even when they're no good anymore. Now, Emerson will apply this to tradition. Emerson will apply this to learning. You know, we just have blindly accepted that there are things that are cultural and good, but no one ever questions whether they're good or not. Like, you know, the classic Shakespeare, literature, art, squelching any possibility of real originality. But um, beyond that, though, I mean, Emerson's going to apply this to religion, saying, why do we believe in the Trinity? Why are we Calvinists? Why do we go to church this way? Why do we have these rituals? Why do we pray this way? And his answer will be because this is just blind superstition that we inherited from people who are a lot more, a lot dumber than us, who are living in a primitive world, who believed in spirits and ghosts. He said, look, we as modern, scientific, smart people have moved way beyond this. We don't believe in this stuff anymore. And yet we hold on to these rituals. Biggest among them is religion. And we just do things that don't make any sense anymore, but we keep doing them because we're afraid to do anything else. Religion, in Emerson's mind, is a foolish consistency. And that is a hobgoblin of little minds. I want to move on to this woman named Margaret Fuller, who's friends with Emerson. They're in this transcendentalist circle. Uh, Margaret Fuller uh, was an educator, and she actually ran a school, a very experimental school. And she took many of ideas that were transcendentalist and Emersonian and applied them to her the way she educated children. And she had a philosophy of education, which might sound actually oddly familiar. The old mode of education, as I described before, was there is a body of canonical true knowledge. And the idea is to just get kids to memorize this stuff, know this stuff inside and out. It didn't actually say much about whether it transformed your soul. They assumed it would, but it was just memorize, 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 know, know, know the right stuff, and don't divert from it. Just got to know the right stuff. Margaret Fuller and Emerson, they weren't opposed to reading Shakespeare. They weren't opposed to reading Milton. They weren't opposed to reading Latin. But they thought the problem is we use this stuff as like the truth and you must submit and yield to it and just worship it and love it and never question it. They would say instead, if you're – you don't actually have to read great literature at all or great ideas or see great art, whatever great means. But rather the purpose of this stuff, if you're going to use it, is not to enslave your mind to the canons of the past. This stuff is merely fertilizer for the seed of your mind. It's here to stimulate you. It's here to get you to think. You don't read Shakespeare to become a slave of Shakespeare. You read Shakespeare so that it gets your mind thinking and rolling. And then you write your own stuff. It'll be different from Shakespeare. It'll be better than Shakespeare. But you've got to do your own stuff. You've got to learn how to be original and create your own kind of ideas. Uh, yeah, so the great works of the past, they're not great. They're just works, and they may or may not be useful to the extent that they can stimulate you, inspire you to be provocative and come up with your own ideas. Margaret Fuller did not run her classes that you might imagine, like memorization factors where you just no, 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 memorize things. But rather, instead of like lines where they heard lectures, they sat in a circle and they had discussions. And the idea is she would ask questions to provoke, to prod, to inspire little minds. 
And the idea is that in every child is a seed that's uniquely their seed. Every child is a different kind of plant. And they all seize in them. They don't know who they're going to turn into. So her idea is I will draw who you are out of you. I'm going to use my education to allow you to be free and grow. So again, it's, I'm not going to crush you with the great canons of the past, but rather I'm going to draw who you are out of you and you will grow and I will inspire you. Um, and origin, the key is not submit to the tradition, but use whatever education we can to curate and cultivate and allow you to grow in your own originality. So at the end of the day, I'm not telling you who to be. I'm just helping you become who you always are. This kind of philosophy, as you imagine, I mean, I, I find this very seductive, very inspiring, especially when you're young. I mean, again, to be great is to be misunderstood. No one gets me. Yeah, that's because you're great. Um, I, I fell in love with this stuff in high school. I mean, this in many ways inspired me to become a scholar, to become a student. I love this. As I get older, though, I realize that this is, um, I don't want to completely throw it away. I think there's something redemptive about this that's worth thinking about. But I also want to think about why this is problematic, especially as a Christian. Um, if the entire philosophy of transcendentalism and romanticism is that um, the, the past is irrelevant, authority is irrelevant. In fact, these things are not just irrelevant, but they're actually evil because the most important thing is a truth that lies within your own heart. And the point of much of our lives is to shed tradition and external authority so that I can grow and flourish on my own. And I'm guided by what? My own original genius or I'm guided by my own appetites, my own desires, which are uniquely my own and in many ways accountable to no one but myself. Uh, yeah, I can see why that's seductive. I can see why that's appealing. But what does that have to do with religion? What, what does God tell us? What does revealed Christianity tell us? Well, in many ways, quite the opposite. Now, you are a unique being made by God, and God loves you. God loves every one of us, and God knows us as individuals, not just as blanket humanity. He knows us as blanket humanity of the world, but he also knows us as individuals. And yet, though, part of being a Christian, part of what it means to be a child of God is to submit to God, to yield to God, to give oneself over to God's godly orders. God knows we have desires. Desires are good, but our desires have to, our, our, our loves have to be properly ordered. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and everything else will follow. You have to love God first. It's okay to love food. It's okay to love physical pleasure. It's okay to love art. But God has an order for where that love is. Now, the romantics would say, no, 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 no. The order is artificially imposed upon us by authority. My, my, my loves are my own. I should only love that which I love, and no one should ever tell me how not to love. Uh, in many ways, I think the moral and intellectual chaos of our modern world is very much a result of, the, I think, the legacy of romanticism, which is to say, follow your heart and listen to no one else. Let me commend to you, uh, and it, it'll be a challenge, but there are a couple books I'd like you to think about. One is After Virtue by Alistair McIntyre. This is an amazing book. It, it's hard to read, and I don't know if at some point you want to read it and you want to talk to me about it. I would be happy to help you think through this. He's thinking about the moral chaos, the intellectual, theological chaos that's been a result of the modern world which we live in, which I think is in many ways rooted in romanticism and some of these ideas that started coming out. Another book, which this is even a, this is a monster book. This is huge. A Secular Age by, by Charles Taylor. Again, similar to Alistair McIntyre about what is this modern world we live in? It had so much promise. It was supposed to usher in utopia. Instead, it's brought in epistemic, intellectual, moral chaos. Um, another Charles Taylor book. This is a, also the same, same guy, same Charles Taylor. This is a shorter book. Um, it's called The Ethics of Authenticity. What he's trying to argue in this book, and I think it's kind of – he doesn't want to throw out all of – the idea of I want to be myself. I want to be true to myself all right. versus I must yield to the proper order of the universe. He's saying, you know, there's something – in the middle, there's a way in which it's good to have authenticity. It's good to be true to yourself. At the same time, yeah, there's a greater order in which we have to submit ourselves over to. Uh, I don't have to get into that. I don't have time to get into that right now. But understand that these are complicated ideas. Um, so, yeah, romanticism is interesting. It's inspiring. It inspired me. I can see why a lot of people would like it. And yet um, – it has a lot of theological, philosophical implications. And in many ways, as I said before, I think we live in, the, in that world. Uh, romanticism shatters uh, the meta-narrative, the order that is above us. And it makes us 
in many ways, our own gods. And so this is interesting. It's worth thinking about. There are elements of romanticism and that, that are worth thinking about and pulling out. But yet, it's a profoundly problematic way to build our world. All right, I've really enjoyed teaching you guys. So uh, yes, perhaps we can continue this conversation in the future.